Father God, we thank you again for the opportunity of gathering in this place that you have provided for us, either in person or online, for the strength that you've given us and the breath of life to be here this morning, to be able to glorify your name and, Lord, and the comfort of this place. We, we enjoy the fellowship and we enjoy just being able to praise your name and we feel safe and secure. But, Lord, there are people who are suffering today who are going through things that we can't even imagine. We, we can't even fathom the ugliness and the evilness that is happening in those parts of the world right now. And Father, we lift up Israel and we lift up the Israelites and your people there. All those men, women, the children of all ages who have for centuries, Lord, their line has been attacked. They have been under this persecution. And Lord, right now, evil is just surrounding them and is just coming down on them. is causing so much pain and suffering. And Lord, we're lifting them up and asking for your hand of protection to be over each and every one of them. We pray for the leadership. We pray for discernment, Lord. That, Lord, they would do and act in the ways that would be, Lord, correct and appropriate for the situation and circumstances that they're dealing with. But, Lord, we also pray, I pray, Lord, for those that are on the other side. The innocent lives in those other nations that are under the ugly hand of these men and these people who seek evil and don't seek righteousness and don't seek you and don't seek the goodness of God. But for their own desires and their own sakes are enacting laws and enacting rules and doing things that are bringing such suffering to people. And blinding their eyes to the truth that there is a hope and that there is a Savior, that there is a light of the world, and that is Jesus Christ. And even though they, Lord, denounce you, and even though they say that you aren't who you say you are, and they they fight against you, it does not change the fact that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That you are the great I am. And that you love even them. Jesus, when you were on the cross... You cried out and said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, we do things foolishly. We do things out of spite, out of anger, out of bitterness. Men do evil things because they are blind and they're wrapped up in their sinful nature and they don't know the truth. But you love them. Even those who, Lord, were beating you. Those who were whipping you, those who were mocking you, those who were punching you, even those who did that to you, you love them because they didn't understand your purpose. And Father, we acknowledge that today. And we pray for the people in that region. We pray for the nations of the world that are taking sides. We pray for the the leaders that are, are looking at these things and making decisions. Father, we know that your will will be done. That all things are going to be fulfilled such as you have preordained them to do. We're seeing things played out in our time, Lord, that you, before the foundations of the earth said, would happen. Lord, give us discernment to pray in the proper way to give you praise, honor, and glory. And plead mercy for those who don't understand. Help us to stand in the gap for those who are doing the evil. Help us to stand in the gap for those who are innocent, are caught up in the middle of all the ugliness that is happening there. Help us, Lord, to seek you and your will to be done, your kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. Father, be with Israel. Be with those who love Israel. And have mercy on the enemies that are trying to destroy her. In the end, all things will be fulfilled as you said. And we will see all things as they are. Nothing will be hidden. It will be brought out in the light in you because you are the light of the world. Bless those people there, Father. And help us to bend the knee in a way that brings you honor and glory towards them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. While you're still standing, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And let us read. Chapter 13, 
We're looking at uh, the last chapter in this book, and it's, uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 as our base text this morning. And the Word of God says, On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found that no Amorite or Moabite should ever be, should ever be attending in the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelis with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. But our God, however, turned that curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. May God bless his word. You may take a seat. You ever watch a movie or a program? <clears throat> and when it starts out, it doesn't make sense. You, you start watching this movie, maybe it, it's, it starts out in, in a black screen and you hear some sounds and that, and then it fades to some, some scene that just doesn't make sense. Maybe there's a, a car chase or, or there's someone who's running and you can hear their breath and, and you can see that they're in trouble. Or maybe there's explosions going on and, and there's all these things and you're like, what is going on here? There's, none of this makes sense to me. But as you watch the movie, then it kind of goes to a different scene, and it starts from that point, and then it comes back to that original scene, and you're saying, oh, now it makes sense. Now I understand why the car chase. Now I understand why that person was running. Now I understand all that, because now you know the context of what that original scene was. Now that other things come to light, it makes sense. Chapter 13 of Nehemiah kind of starts off that way. Chapter 13 says, hey, we, we read the book, we read the law, and we found some information in there, and now we've taken action, right? The people of God have gotten to a place where they had restored the kingdom, they had restored the wall, they had put the gates back in place, the doors in place, and, and everything was, was coming back into the way it should be. They had read the law. Ezra had been teaching from the law, and they had learned about some of the old uh, feasts that the ancestors had done, and so they re-implemented that, putting everything back in order. <clears throat> and as we read last week, there was this great celebration. In chapter 12, right, Nehemiah says, hey, the, the Levites, the, the musicians, the gatekeepers, they, all the singers, we had cymbals and, and harps and lyres, and we had all these instruments, and we were on the wall, and I set half one way, and I set half the other way, and we had a dedication, a great celebration. In fact, it was such a great celebration. It was so loud, and we were so joyful that it could be heard far away from the kingdom. That's how we kind of end the story of Nehemiah in chapter 12. But there's actually a time that goes between chapter 12 and chapter 13. We don't know how much time, but there was a great time, many years that passed in between the two chapters. And what had happened is Nehemiah actually goes back to serve King Artaxerxes. Remember, he was serving him as a cupbearer in chapter 1. And now chapter 13 starts off with something that when Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem after being away for a while... He's shocked. He's disturbed. I mean, he is really furious and angry at what he sees happening in the kingdom. It's that kind of story, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? Or when mom and dad tell their, their young kids, their adolescent kids, hey, we're, we're going to go out for dinner or we're going to go out and visit some friends or we're going to be gone for a while. So while we're gone, don't get hurt. No horse playing. Don't be throwing stuff around. Don't invite your crazy friends. I know how your friends are. Don't want them here. Don't turn on the stove. Don't play with fire. You might set a fire. You might get the kitchen on fire. We don't, don't do any of those things. While we're gone, don't. Well, the Israelites did all those things. They started inviting friends over. They started playing with fire. And they were about to burn the kingdom down again. And go right back to the same place they were at when we started looking at this several months ago. When they were in trouble and when they were in disgrace. What happens as we look at chapter 13 is that, chapter 13, 
is that promises were broken. Remember, they had heard the law and they had heard the word and they said, you know what, this is right. And we're going we're gonna, to, with an oath, and our leaders are going to put their names down. We promise that we, we're going to obligate ourselves to following God and following his ways. And from here on out, we're dedicating our children. We're dedicating our families. We're dedicating our resources. We're not going to buy anything on the Sabbath. We're not going to be messing with those people. We are committing ourselves to the things of God. And to make this sure and to make this so profound that our leaders are going to sign their name as, as a seal that as a nation, we are going to go and follow these things. But when Nehemiah comes back, what he finds is not the people following God. What he finds is so disturbing, he has this anger, this righteous anger for what he sees. Look at verse 4. It says, before this, and before this is before what we read in verses 1 through 3. So before we read that, it says, Elisha, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. And he had provided him a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings, the incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers as well as the contributions for the priests. You see what happened? He says, hey, hey before they read the law and before they found that they, they should not be associated with these, when I come back, the high priest, Elisha, who was in charge of basically everything that happens in the temple, he was in charge of the priests, he was in charge of the musicians, he was in charge of the gatekeepers, he was directing and coordinating things, he was in charge of receiving all the offerings and the store, for the storehouses, all the grains, the oils, all the things that were being brought into the temple for the use in the temple, to support the people who were active in the temple. He was in charge of all of that. And there were rooms where they would bring those things and put them in. And Nehemiah says, when I go back... He has to buy it in those rooms. So imagine if you were to come next week. And right across these steps, there's a wall. And all you see is the two doors. And you'd walk in and say, hey, what's going on? What, what, what does this mean? i say, well, you know, uh, this guy I know kind of needs some space. And we only use that every now and then. So I'm kind of letting him use that space. And you may say, well, that seems odd. I mean, we, that's where the worshipers were. That's where the instruments were. We, we can't see the screens anymore. And I'm saying, well, you know, he, he needs some space. And then the following week you come and you're like, hey, how come the kitchen is closed off and part of the sanctuary is closed off? I said, well, we don't use the kitchen except every now and then to do refreshments. And every now and then we have an event, but he needed some more room. And, and he's got a lot of stuff, so we had to... And then you're saying, well, where do we do our tithes and offerings? And where do we, well, we don't have room for those things anymore. And what about Sunday school? Well, we can't get supplies for Sunday school because we're not collecting tithes and offerings. And I would hope that you would not, without a question, throw me out on the curb as fast as you could. Bafuera, just throw me out and get rid of me. Well, that's what he did. The high priest moved the stuff of God out of the house of God to make room for this man. He moved all the stuff out and he invited him in. And Elijah was a very important person. He was the high priest, but he also played a very integral part in the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of the gates. If we look back at chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Elijah the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated and it set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of a Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. So he's the first guy that once he hears why Nehemiah came, he's like, let's do it. Right? Remember Nehemiah was in um, Persia, and his brother came and said, hey, the people back at home, the homeland, they're in trouble. The walls destroyed, the city's a mess. They're, they're just completely dejected. Nothing good is happening. They're, they're in disgrace. 
And what did Nehemiah do? He's like, I'm going to God. And Nehemiah prays to God and said, Lord, God, forgive me. Right here. Start here. Forgive me. Forgive my family. For, forgive us. Forgive my household. Forgive us, your people, because we have acted wickedly against you and your ways. Nehemiah makes that prayer. He goes to Jerusalem. He spends three days going around looking at the situation, assessing the wall, assessing the people. No one asks him anything. And then finally around chapter 2 he says, hey, you, you guys, we're in trouble here. And he speaks to the elders. He speaks to the, to the leaders of the church and says, hey, we got to get busy about rebuilding this. And we see here that Elisha is the first one and says, you know what, you're right. And he gets the priests active and they start building the, the wall and they start building to where the sheep gate is. So he is very aware of how important all this is. And somehow he was associated with Tobiah. Somehow he was familiar of this guy. And not only does he open the door for Tobiah to come in, but he sets more room for him and says, keep bringing your baggage and your luggage and all your stuff and we'll just keep making more room for him. And he's taking the things of God out to make room for this guy. We need to remember who Tobiah was. Tobiah was one of the enemies of God's, God's people. Tobiah was one of the guys that from the very beginning of the rebuilding was mocking, ridiculing, trying to discourage Nehemiah and the people of God. Remember in chapter 2, in verse 10, it says, When Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Amorite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. This guy wanted nothing good to happen for the people of God. He hated the people of God. He hated the kingdom of God. Thus, he hated God. And this is the very guy that now is where? In the house, in the temple. What happened? When you look at this, you're saying, well, is there a typo here? Is this maybe a part of a different story that somehow got mixed up here? It doesn't make sense. Because after all, the people were celebrating. The people were dedicated. The people were united. There was this, this image and picture of just everything going right. Everything restored. Everybody happy. Everybody praising God. They had committed themselves. So how is it possible that now years later, the enemy is in the temple of God's house? Somewhere along the way, the leadership lost their way. Somewhere along the way, the people lost focus. Somewhere during those years of, of Nehemiah being gone, people became complacent and became accepting of the ways of the enemy. And they started to, to compromise to the point where they became comfortable and got close with the enemy and allowed the enemy to come in. These were not good people. The, the Sambalots, the Tobias, the Gershoms, all these were enemies. And we see from, from chapter 2 on through about chapter 6 where, where they keep mounting and mounting and mounting. And we kind of lose track of them in chapter 6. In chapter 6, they, they tried to create some havoc within the kingdom. And then they tried to, uh, to get Nehemiah to come out of the kingdom to have a discussion with him and try to compromise with him. Remember, they were saying, why don't you come, let's meet, let's reason together. Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's just meet at a neutral place and just talk things over. Let's compromise in our positions here. What they're really trying to do is try and get Nehemiah out so they could kill him. Because they didn't want him to continue the work of rebuilding the kingdom of God. And what did Nehemiah say? I ain't got time for you guys. He says, don't you realize the work that I'm involved in is far greater than spending time with you? This is more important to me than to even entertain a conversation with you. This has far more significant value and importance to me to serve God and to follow God and to do the work that God has put in my hands than to pause to go and spend a little time with you and just hear you out. At that point, they weren't willing to compromise. But something happened. And remember that Sambalot and Tobiah continued to ridicule them. In verse 
19 of chapter 3, it says, But when Sambalot the Horonite, Tobiah the Amorite official, and Gershom the, the Arab heard about this, heard about the rebuilding, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that you're doing, they said. Are you rebelling against the king? So these were the very sworn enemies of the people of God. And now we get to chapter 13. And lo and behold, who's in the temple of God? How you like them apples? The enemy is right in the temple of God. And remember, the name Sambalot and the name Tam, uh, Tobiah, what those names mean was enemy of God, enemy in secret. It was a, a thorn. It was this, this prickly bush like a thorn in your side. That's what they had been throughout the first six chapters, a thorn in the side of Nehemiah and the people of God. They had been the enemy in secret. Well, now it's no secret where they are. They're in the house of God. And the high priest moved the stuff of God out to make room for the enemy. We need to be on guard. As sons and daughters of the living God, we need to be on guard. We need to be mindful and intentional of our faith and our walk. We need to be wise at what we hear and what we see. We need to be very concerned about the things that are being said and make sure that we're listening to that, but comparing it to the word of God and seeing if it measures up. There's a lot of people saying stuff out there that sounds right, that looks right, but when you compare it to the Word of God, it is not right. And there's so many people out there that are, are supposed preachers and teachers of the Word of God. And they speak in ways that, that you, you hear and it's like, well, that sounds beautiful. And they may even use a southern accent to kind of buy you into it. And give you fluffy stories about when I was a little boy in the country. And they're just covering up the lies and deception that they're giving you. We need to be careful about what we're listening so we do not get fooled into what the enemy is trying to tell us. The Apostle Paul preached against this. He spoke about this and he was concerned about the people saying, hey, you know, you, you so easily could be fooled if you're not careful about what you listen and what you do. He said this in 2 Corinthians. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the spirit's cunning... By the serpent's cunning, excuse me. Your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we've preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you had accepted, you put up with it easily enough. He was saying, listen, there's these false teachers and prophets and, and people out there that are going to come with things that are not from God. And, and if you don't know the difference, you can easily accept it and be deceived just like Eve was deceived. Who she traded the truth for a lie. And she was easily, it seems, deceived. We don't know how long the serpent was working on her mentally and emotionally, but she made a decision that was wrong. And she opened the door for sin to come in. Paul was saying, listen, I, I'm concerned about you. And that's why I'm telling you these things. That's why I'm teaching these things to you. Because you need to know the difference. And we need to stand for what is right. We need to stand for the word of God. We need to stand for the truth of God. To be able to combat the lies of the devil. To be able to combat the falsehoods that are being taught and teached out there. Second Corinthians, that same chapter says this. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things that they boast about. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm going to continue to preach the word. I'm going to continue to say what I'm saying. I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing just to take away the argument they have because they're boasting in their abilities. But remember, what did Paul say? I boast in Christ. That's who I boast in. He goes on and says, for such people are false apostles deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself masqueraded as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end, the end will be what their actions deserve. 
There are those who are playing with God, those who are playing church, those who are, are acting out things and teaching and working in ways that are contrary to the words of God, and they know they're doing it wrong. And some of us will look at that and say, well, God, why don't you do something about that? Why don't you just take care of that? God is a righteous God, and in his time, he will bring judgment. And judgment is coming. In spite of what the world says, in spite of what world leaders say, no matter what society says, no matter what the, the politicians say, no matter how wise or, or smart we think, judgment is coming. And we need to know the difference between right and wrong, the ways of God and the ways of the world, and we need not to be comfortable or complacent and allow those things to come into our lives, into our homes, into our churches, as many have. God is going to bring judgment. Galatians says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to, ple to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. People feel like they can get away playing with church and playing with God. But whatever you reap or whatever you sow, you will reap. Don't get tired of following God. Don't give up in listening to the word of God. Don't get up, give up in testing the things you hear and compare it. Don't get complacent and rely on somebody else's knowledge. The Bereans, when they, were, when they were, had information brought to them, what did they do? They'd go and get the scriptures, and they'd go and look, and they'd make sure and say, hey, what is he saying? Does it match up with this? Okay, it does. Then we're with you, brother. Oh, no, that doesn't match up with this because this is the truth. This is what we're going to follow. This is the word of God. This is God speaking to us. And if what you're teaching doesn't match up with this, you got a problem because I'm going to follow this. We don't get tired of following the word of God. And the world is full of people who are going to be saying things. And in today, I mean, it is amazing the falsehoods that we hear, the blatant lies, the way the world and Satan has twisted things because he acts like a, an angel of light. He masquerades as the truth when he is nothing but a liar. The people in the day of Nehemiah, after all they had accomplished, I mean, I don't know if, if you can imagine to the depth of this, after being in total despair, years of being depressed and of being held down, the enemies weren't saying anything. They didn't have to worry about it because they were in defeat already. The people of God were in defeat. So there was no reason for the Sambalots, the Tobias, and those people to say anything because they had the people of God where they wanted them. Still down and beaten up. But now Nehemiah comes and he starts saying, hey, guys, we're in trouble. Let's get to work. They start to work. They start to get busy about the things of God. They start rebuilding the wall. They start rebuilding the, the, the kingdom itself. Now the enemy starts to ridicule and starts to mock and starts to get active. Like I've said before, if you don't have any spiritual battles going on in your life, I'd be concerned. I'm not saying go out and look for trouble, okay? Don't get me wrong there. But it's going to happen. If you are seeking God and you are trying to do, live a righteous life, then the enemy's not going to be happy. He's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to cause problems. He's going to try to bring divisions. He's going to try to bring dissension. He's going to try to cause whatever he can to get you not to follow the ways of God and try to live a righteous life. And we need to know the difference. And we need to be mindful of those things. And we need to be in the word of God. And when someone comes and gives us a word and say, this is from God, hey, how does that match up? I've had many people come and tell me things. I say, you know, thank you for that. I'll be praying on that. And there are some times that you just feel because you're going through things and you've been praying. And there's someone brings a word and you know the spirit just immediately hits you. And you know that it's from God. But there's other times you're like, hmm. I think I'm going to check that out. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your concern. Lord, 
You know my heart. You know where I'm at. You know what's happening. My brother, my sister said this. Is this the answer? Is this the direction? Is this your word? How does that line up with what you have done? How does that line up with the spirit, the the, the word of God? How does that line up with, with what you want me to do? If it doesn't match, you go to the brother and sister and say, thank you. I'm going to keep praying about that. And maybe even the Spirit of God will say, hey, you know what? Correct them because I love them and I want them to know. I want them to understand too. But we need to know the difference. God cannot be deceived. What happened in chapter 13 happened after some time. Nehemiah comes back and he sees this and he is I mean, he's beside himself. And so he starts off with saying, look, we read the book, the law of Moses. We read what he wrote down. We found out some information, and so we started doing some things. But later in the chapter, starting in verse 4, he talks about it. And then in verse 6, he says this. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I had asked permission and came back to Jerusalem where I learned about the evil thing Elisha had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room and I gave orders to purify the room and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. He couldn't have believed what he saw. And when he gets there, he says, oh, no. No way. How could you allow this to happen? Do you realize the evil you have done? After everything that God has done, after all how God has demonstrated his power and his authority and his love for us, after all that has happened, you allow the enemy to come in? So what you've done is you take the things of God for the ministry of God, for the work of God in the house of God, and you put that out to bring in the enemy? We have to be careful because the evil one works that way. Little by little, he wants to get into our lives. Little by little, he wants to see if we can get comfortable with him. Little by little, sin wants to see if it's okay. It's it's not that bad. I, I know it looks bad, but listen... As long as your, your intentions are good, you can do that. That's okay. And then you start getting comfortable with that. And then a little bit more time passes. And now it's not only this, but now this you're going to get comfortable with. And as you make room for that, then the, the time for serving God, the time for reading the word, the time for being in prayer, the time for fellowship, the time for service, you don't have time for that because now you're doing all these other things that have come in. And now instead of being focused on the word of God and being focused on the things of God, now your attention is over here on things that are not of God. You've invited and allowed those things to come in. He's saying, listen, when I got there, I threw Tobiah and his stuff out. Get your junk out of here. And then he says, you know what, we got to clean this place out. we got to wash and scrub the walls. we got to scrub the floor. we got to get that smell out of here. We don't want any of that here. We want to bring all the stuff that should be here, the things of God, so that the people of God could be working, so that the things of God can be done, so that God's word and ways could be shown and be uh, taught to the people. That's what's supposed to be here, not all this other stuff. And he again comes back in and put things in order. Galatians says this, Paul speaking says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who you called to live, called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul was talking to those in Galatians saying, listen, There's something going on here. It's not right. And it seems like you can easily be fooled because you haven't been in study. You haven't been in the word. You haven't been in fellowship. You haven't been seeking the ways of God. You haven't put God in the proper priority. He's not the number one thing on your list of ones. You've made room for all this other stuff. You've moved him out and you brought other stuff in. And you can so easily be fooled. And God is no respect of persons. 
Paul was warning him, because look, judgment is coming. God is going to deal with sin. God is going to deal with the sin in your life. And we can repent of those things now and be done with it, or we're going to deal with it later. In verse 8, he says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally damned. That's harsh. But people, we're talking about eternity. We're not talking about temporary pleasures. We're not talking about being comfortable. We're not talking about, about just enjoying life now. People are dying and they're either going to go to heaven or they're going to go to hell. That is the truth. You either know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. You either have repented of your sins and you enter into fellowship with him or you're playing games and you're not listening to him and judgment is coming. And Paul is saying, listen, even if I was to preach something different, let me be damned. Or if an angel was to come, let he be damned. He says, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you've accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Remember who Paul was. Paul before was Paul was, was Saul. And he was on a path of being the most popular, most sought after, most well-recognized, most uh, acknowledged religious leader of the day. He could argue the law like nobody else. People wanted to be around him. People wanted to hear him speak. People wanted to, to be associated with him because he was on this career path that was elevating him to the highest standards known to man. In the religious circles. And he could have continued. He's saying, hey, I could have continued doing that if I wanted to please people. But see, what happened was in my path, I met Jesus. And he made me see the difference between right and wrong. And how I was doing things to please myself and please others. And I was fighting against him and rejecting him and his truth. And when I realized that, I repented of my sins. And now I'm following the ways of Christ. If I wanted to please people... I could have stayed on that path. If I wanted to earn the, rec the recognition, respect of people, I could have kept saying all those pretty things that people like to hear. Tell people God is merciful and loving and gracious. Just be good and just be, you know, have a good life. Make sure you're giving your tithes and offerings. Buy my book and my CD. Every now and then let's have a cup of coffee. Everything is good. Don't worry about what's going on. Or I could say, listen, if you do not repent of your sins, and if you do not come to know the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, there is a day coming that you are going to enter into eternity, and you are either going to be with him in heaven, or you are going to be apart from him forever and ever. There is a choice we have to make. As I said many times, we all have an eternity. Where you spend it is what really matters. And that decision is today. It's not later. You can't get to a certain point in your life and then decide, you know, um, oh, I'm going to die tomorrow? Okay, well, let me get myself right now. We don't know the days we have. We don't know the hour that's going to come. We don't know the accident, the tragedy. We don't know what's going to happen that we will be here today and gone tomorrow. But we do know that we have an eternity. And you will spend it either with heaven, in heaven with God, or you will not. Remember Jesus when he was preaching. And he was telling the people, hey, choose the narrow gate. Choose that narrow gate because wide is the, the gate and the road that leads to destruction. And many go to it. But narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And few are those who choose it. The world is running headlong in that wide road. They're going through that gate. People, and there's others saying, come this way. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. You just, you're, you're okay. That's accepting. God knows. Don't worry about it. And people are dying without knowing Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, yeah, I'm not here to please people. 
I'm here to please Christ. Because if I wanted an easy life, I would have kept what I had before. You guys know that in your workplace, in the community, even within your families, when you make a decision to follow Jesus, it gets a little difficult. You, you start having a little friction, a little tension. You, you start having some, some butting of heads, if you will. And you could say, you know what? I don't want to deal with that, so I'm going to give in. I'm going to get comfortable. I'm going to allow those things. I'm going to become complacent. It's easier to do it that way. Sure it is. But the end result, the eternal result is not easy. I want to encourage you to keep seeking God. Keep on that path. Don't grow weary. Don't get tired. Don't give up. Don't get comfortable. Don't get complacent. Don't give up the space that you have for God for the things of this world. Don't open the door for the enemy to come in and start setting up camp because you know what? You, you say, well, I'm just going to give him a little peek inside. The next thing you know, you're saying, come on in, back up that U-Haul, bring in all that stuff. And little by little, Satan takes over. Peter was encouraging the people at his time, and he said this. But there were also false prophets among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing in swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow the deprived conduct and will bring the way of truth into, disrep into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them. And their destruction has not been sleeping. Judgment is going to come. Some of us have been hearing our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents talk about Jesus is coming soon. And we're like, really? I mean, by now, certainly, I've been hearing that for so long. And we're getting conditioned that we want everything now and fast, right? We order stuff online and we're like, what do you mean I have to wait till 7 p.m. tomorrow? And then you want to track it and find out what time it's going to get there. Okay, it's off for of delivery. All right. Whew, can't wait for that package to come. We want to do that. We say, okay, where's Jesus? I want to be able to track him. Look at the signs are all around us. Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes, all these things happening. Parents turning against the children. Children turning against their parents. Evil all over. The love of many have fallen cold. Jesus is coming soon. And Peter was giving him this acknowledgement, and he said this, For if God, in verse 4, did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, why? A preacher of righteousness and seven others. Noah was a righteous man. And his family who heard him and believed in him got in the ark. When judgment came, who was saved? Noah and his family. Why? Because they heard, they believed, they trusted. Even when everyone else didn't. Everyone had the opportunity. Everyone could have got into the ark. But nobody wanted to go in. And when judgment came, as we read last week, I said they didn't know what happened. Continues in verse 6, as if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes. And he made them an example, and listen to this, of what is going to happen to the ungodly. What is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, who was what? A righteous man. Who was distressed by the depravity conduct of the lawless. From that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. And we are living in some wicked times. We are seeing some ungodly things happen. We are seeing people who are flat out boldly insulting Christianity, insulting Christ and saying there is no God. We're seeing this in movies. We're seeing this, the artists who are doing these concerts and doing such evil and wicked things, mocking God. 
in such horrific ways, it's unspeakable what they're doing. Judgment is coming. He continues to say, if this is so, meaning that God saves the righteous, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from their trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and dispute authority. Nehemiah comes back and says, what have you done? You have taken the things of God out and you've brought the things of the enemy in. You've allowed him to set up camp. You have come comfortable with him. You have become complacent in your walk. You have become complacent in the things of God. And you have rejected the very God who saved you, who, who restored the kingdom, who restored your life, who brought things back into order so that you can bring this into your life. And sadly, there are many people that live that way today. How many people that we know who started out so well walking in the faith, who were on fire for Jesus, who, who knew the word and were preaching and were teaching, and today you can't tell the difference between them and a Tony Roberts who's a motivational speaker. And you question if they still have faith because all they want to talk about is their airplanes and talk about their money and talk about their houses and talk about what they have done and how they've accomplished things and talk about their books and their movies and all that they are doing and leading people in the wrong direction. I said before, I'm not a fan of Christian TV. Not everyone on there is bad, but there's a lot of ugly and deceitful things being taught there. And we need to know the difference between the Word of God and the deceptive ways of man, the schemes of man. We need to be quick to listen and slow to answer and react. We need to measure everything that we're hearing and making sure that those are the things of God and we're not pushing out the things of God to make room for the things that are not of God. Because there's a day coming. Jesus is returning. And he's looking for a people who are holy as he is holy. That means being set apart. That means rejecting the things of this world, rejecting sin, and in spite of how difficult it is, saying we're going to walk on this path because this path leads to righteousness. Like Noah did. Like Lot did. Like so many others. Who in spite of all the ugly stuff that was happening around them, didn't get distracted by all those things, but they stayed focused on the word of God and the ways of God. To live a life that was pleasing and righteous unto God. The evil one is at work in our communities, in our cities, in our lives. He's trying to get somehow to get in there and be able to set up camp in your heart and in my heart. He's trying to get into the churches and trying to turn the churches into something that they're not supposed to be. The Apostle John, years advanced is sentenced to the island of Patmos because they wanted to shut him up. In those days, they, they, they sent him to this island where they were just going to have him break rocks for the rest of his years and, and be done with him. And they tried to, to shut him up. And, and where is Jesus? Where is the revelation of Jesus made to him so that we could have it today? You see, because it doesn't matter what the enemy wants to do. God's word is going to get out. It doesn't matter what Satan tries to do. The truth of God will get out. It doesn't matter how hard the world works and the enemy works. Nothing is going to stop the truth of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed so that people can come and hear that there is a hope. And in that book, he's writing about heaven. He's writing about things. He's trying to describe all that he's seen. And, and you can tell, at least for me, that he's struggling to try to, to put in proper context the enormity and the, the splendor and the majesty of everything that he's seeing to try to communicate how powerful and how, how great God is. And then he writes this in chapter 22. The words from Jesus saying, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash your robes. 
that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go into the gates or may go through the gates into the city. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and even those who love and practice falsehoods. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the living water. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And he is coming for a people who have believed in him, who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, who have rejected the lies of the world, who have rejected the lies of the evil one, who have rejected this world, and who have not made room in their heart for the things of this world. What have you made room in your life for? What is occupying your mind, your thoughts, your attitude? What is it that you're concerned about today that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ? We're full of distractions, people. Our young people are being lost in the streets. They're being lost in the school systems because they're being taught lies and taught things that are not edifying. They have turn from the good things and the, and, and the things that were moral and ethical and are now doing the immoral and the unethical things. But thank God for those who are still faithful, that remnant of teachers, administrators, and people who are in the school system who are still available to try to help those kids. But you know what? They need help. They need mom and dads. They need grandparents, uncles and aunts. They need churches. They need people of God who are going to be there to help them through the difficult difficulties of this life. People who have not made room for the things of the world, but have said, no, this is God's house. This heart belongs to God. This life belongs to God. I don't have time for the things of this world. Why? Because I want to make room for nothing but Jesus Christ and his ways. What have you made room in your life for? Nehemiah comes back and he is shocked at what he sees. He is horrified at what has happened. He goes away. The people are celebrating. Everything's right. Years later, he comes back. Uh Uh-oh. There's a horrible problem that happened here. And what does he do? Cleans house. Doesn't even think about it. He knows right from wrong. But somehow the leadership, somehow the people of God, somehow those that that were experiencing in chapter 12 revival and excitement and celebrating and singing a song they hadn't sung before, now years later, they're not even in the temple. They're not even active. Because what happened was as Tobiah came in and, and they didn't have the storerooms anymore, they didn't have the space for stuff, they left the temple to go back to the fields, to go back to their homes because they had to live. Those who were in charge of preaching and teaching and doing the things of God were no longer busy in the things of 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 God because there was nothing being brought in because everybody became complacent and went their own way. What have we made room in our hearts for today? It's not easy to preach these things or talk about it. But he's talking to me. He's talking to all of us. Each and every one of us will have to give an account. I was talking to a sister yesterday, and I was sharing with her, you know what, many times when we speak, it's the person speaking that's being spoken to first. And I have to constantly be evaluating my life and and looking at what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing and what I'm being asked to do or what's being brought in. And then I got to match up to the word of God and say, is this the way you want me to go, God? Is this what you want me to talk about? Is this what you want me to say? Is this what you want me to be? Because if it isn't, don't let me take a step in that direction. Do whatever you have to do so I don't go in that path. Let me not say act in a way that that is not in accordance to your will. Because all I want to do is love Jesus. And all I want is for the space that's in my life to be his space. For him to do what he wants to do. 
and for him to receive the honor and the glory. What have we allowed into our lives that is not pleasing to God? Join me as we pray. Father God, we come before you this hour. Lord, we thank you for your word. And sometimes it's kind of hard to speak these things, and, and it feels heavy, Lord, but, but it's necessary that we're reminded that we belong to you. That we are your sons and daughters, those who have believed in their hearts and profess with their lips that Jesus is my Lord. Our lives should be a reflection of that. Lord, we, we may mess up. We may miss the mark. We may say and do things that are not right in your eyes. May your Holy Spirit quicken us and convict us of those things, that we would repent of that quickly. And Lord, your word says that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Holy Spirit, continue to work in us individually and corporately. Help us to see the will of God the Father. Help us to discern between right and wrong. Help us to be wise to the, the craftiness of sin and of the evil one, the deceptive ways that want to try to draw us away from the truth, from Jesus. The world is in chaotic state, Lord. So many ugly and evil things are happening, and so many people are trying to give an answer and trying to come up with a solution and are saying, if you follow what I believe and if you do what I say and if you, you go in this way, then, then things will work out, and if you don't, then it's not going to work out for, well for you. Lord, we say the only answer is Jesus Christ. The only answer is Jesus Christ. And even when we don't understand things, Lord, we are going to trust you and your word. Even when it doesn't feel comfortable, we are going to trust in the word of God because it is the word of life. Lord, I pray that you forgive us of our sins. Even this hour, forgive me and forgive us, Lord, if there's something that is not right within us. We don't want to be a hindrance for your word to be preached. We don't want to be a hindrance for your word to be taught. We don't want to be, Lord, a hindrance for, for your will to be done. We want to be wise in your ways. Pliable for the Spirit to use us as you want us to be used. Help us not to give room in our lives to the enemy. Holy Spirit, come in like Nehemiah did and take everything out. Purge us and clean us. Renew us, remake us, revive us. Encourage us, even in the dark hours of our lives and in these dark times. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Thank you, Father, for your word. Minister to each and every one. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.